and the Dhyudu Bhai Ambani Institute of Information and Communication Technology and having been a senior fellow at the Center of Study of Developing Societies, he and a visiting professor of universities in Holland and United States and UK, etc. He is now a professor at the Jindal School of Government 
and public policy. Uh, he has been also a kind of a historian of Indian science. Uh, he has taken deep interest in the growth of science and the relationship between science and society. He has uh, written on cognitive justice, urban studies, sociology of corruption and ethics, sociology and philosophy of science, history of technology, traditional knowledge, globalization, etc. And the book which has recently attracted a lot of attention is called Theatres of Democracy Between the Epic and the Everyday. It is he who can connect the epic with the everyday. So here you are, Shri Vishwanathan. Uh, before he delivers the lecture entitled A Special Kind of Democracy, Marxism, Language and Science, I request him to release the latest issue of Naturang, a Hindi journal which has been in publication for more than a hundred issues. It was founded by Nemiji and the issue is here for you too. Thank you. I was warned that surviving Ashok Bajpai would be the first part of this ritual. I didn't know there added Jaram Ramesh to it, but that must be the comic relief part, so I'll get back to being serious. I want to thank Kirti and Tanvir for inviting me, and I must blame some of these ideas on Tanvir Ramal, who was my roommate for years. In fact, I must begin with the story. In fact, that he always thought he was skeptical about my Marxism because I read P.G. Woodhouse. <laughs> he used to let me sleep on a book of Stalin's collected works, but he would never let me join any Stalin party. I think it's time to take revenge. Unfortunately, my talents are singular. I love gossip. In fact, my sisters say I became an anthropologist because I love gossip. But what saddens me is that gossip is not taken seriously. We have historians talking about documentation, about evidence, whether it's Ram Janma Bhumi or whatever else. And I think I'm saddened by this absence of gossip, especially when I think of Marxism. Marxism has been served very badly by storytellers. Your long, boring tracts on ideology, on party conflicts, but you never have that sense of gossip. But that worries me because the Marxism I knew was utterly gossipy. Party was not so important. Ideas were relevant. But I think the most important thing was that, you know, the Marxist revolution was confined to Adda's. We loved conversation. We celebrated conversation, and as a result of it, to a certain extent, there was a revolution of ideas, but nothing more. But I was fascinated with these Marxists. Of course, they treated me with contempt, because I, my reading never went beyond P.G. Woodhouse and other things. But I was fascinated with them, not the important party people, but the ordinary people who loved Marxism and were fascinated by it. 
you know, I remember some of my undergraduate teachers would give you a kind of 45 minute lecture on the revolution. It was so intense, after a while you didn't know whether they were planning revolution, staging a play, or giving you a lecture on social science. But it made undergraduate education fascinating. And I think the beauty of Marxism was not revolution, but the drama, the commitment, the engagement they brought to ordinary life. One loved them for it. One loved them even more because one could disagree so vehemently with it. And what made life interesting was they never forgave you for it. But I think the Marxism has been badly served by its own historians. They lack a sense of gossip. They lack a sense of narrative. In fact, one of the things I really feel is we need an oral history of Marxism. Of all the ordinary, wonderful people who were Marxists but never joined the party. You know, I remember an uncle of mine who to feel the sense of labor would carry sacks back and forth till my grandfather convinced him to return to being a rocket scientist. But that sense of empathy, that sense of caring was something endemic to this generation. I remember a professor of mine who spent years reading Engels, Manchester, and the working class because he wanted to create a Marxist theory of the city. He didn't. But many of these great Marxists belong to the oral tradition. I don't think they even wrote a single footnote. But to me, these autobiographies are important. In fact, these autobiographies are more important than the collective histories of the party. I mean, who cares a shit for Dange? But these people, who were at an aesthetic of Marxism, were to me fascinating. And one of the things I've been doing over the years is collecting stories of Marxists. Many of them were just, how do you put it, drawing room revolutionaries, for whom Marxism was almost an exercise in table manners. But there was a beauty to it, and that an aesthetic. And to me, what was really beautiful about many of these people was Marxists had a sense of drama. In fact, I remember as a kid, I thought Addas were invented so that you could quote Shakespeare and Marx to each other. I mean, the two great quotable quotes of my time were Marx and Shakespeare. And if you mix them up a bit, no one bothered. But there was a beauty to it. And in fact, I would always think that learning was a collection of quotable quotes. So if you had someone imperiously quote something at you, you retreated because you knew there was a certain gravitas to it. But I think that's what made Marxism both serious and funny. It had what to use the coin of word, a seriosity which I loved. And I want to talk about this. Because in a deep and fundamental way we miss this today. In fact, my objection to the BJP and the RSS is it's so boring. The mediocrity of the party stuns me. You don't even get good gossip on it. Even Jaram can't do it. <laughs> and that, to me, that is the interesting thing. Here was a party that talked seriously about ideology, party, class consciousness, but actually generated fascinating gossip. You know, I still remember one of my favorite Marxist friends, Hira Singh. He would disturb every Delhi school seminar by getting up and saying, what about class? Till one day the indomitable Ashish Nandi came in, got up before anyone could say it's something, said, gentlemen, I have a great proposition. Let Mr. Hira Singh ask the question and then we'll proceed with the seminar. <laughs> but there was a laughter to it, which even Hira Singh joined in. Though after that he retaliated by writing a long piece in a well-known magazine called EPW. Uh, to respond to it. But there was a laughter. There was a commitment. There was an idealism. There was a naivete, which I think needs an exercise in storytelling. You know, when radicalism can be all this, it's worth it. But when that same radicalism can be Stalinist, I think it destroys an imagination. So at one level, you had radicalism, which had a certain sense of laughter and celebration of life. And the other level, you had that same radicalism being genocidally Stalinist. In fact, the one thing Indian Marxism is recovering from is Stalinism. 
But even this Stalinism had a certain macabre drama to it. I remember when Brezhnev died. Brezhnev never impressed me. I thought he was one of the most boring Politburo members I could think back. But I was walking through Alipi, a touch of rain, everyone in immaculate white dhotis carrying, walking with umbrellas, as if the umbrellas themselves were political flags indicating a certain kind of mourning. I don't think Brezhnev ever was mourned so beautifully, even in Russia. We Indians know how to mourn people. <coughs> we forget them later. But I think there's a beauty in the way we look at our heroes. In fact, I remember during the Bhopal gas tragedy, a lot of tribals came to have it. And one of them had a beautiful shield. I was impressed till I looked closely. Joseph Stalin was a tribal god. And only India can do it. There was a beauty to it. But there's also a kind of pathetic humor to it. I remember next door at Hindu college when I was in D school, there were three brothers. And you won't believe the story. The names were Hitler Malotra, Mussolini Malotra, and Stalin Malotra. <laughs> now, any, only an Indian family could place bets like that. And I think that was the fascinating thing about India. A sense of celebration, the fact that we could, to a certain extent, have a plural idea. And this is basically what I want to do. I want to look at this Marxism. And I want to begin with my own childhood. In those socialist days, pocket money wouldn't go too far. If you got two bucks, you felt like a millionaire. But if you wanted to buy books, two bucks wouldn't take you very far till you went to the People's Publishing House. PPH was a fascinating place. You know, it was the only place where pocket money could go far, where you felt as if the, the bookshop was a collection, something endowed by Father Christmas. In fact, as a kid, I used to think Karl Marx and Father Christmas were not too separate, till you saw Frederick Engels on the other side of the picture. There was a beauty to it. And I think PPH understood childhood because they thought ideology was adult. So, with all apologies, the collected works of Lenin and Stalin were piled up on one side like a comfortable wall so the child could read on them and read fairy tales. <laughs> and such beautiful fairy tales. I can't think of a place which could, you could read such beautiful books published for two bucks or eight annas. You know, for me, revolution began in a bookshop which was like cornucopia. If two bucks could buy you paradise, then that was my idea of the Russian revolution. And that sense of fascination always haunted me because there was a beauty to this architectonic. One side, children's books. And another side, some of the best books on science for children. Yakov Perelman, do you know? The later books, Why I'm Like Dad, Fun with Mathematics. In fact, I took out copies of them which were over 40 years old this time to read it. Stunning. The Russians were great storytellers when it came to science. But thinking back, what fascinated me about PPH was the fact they kept childhood and science outside ideology. Ideology was for boring adults, for party people. Science and childhood was something different. And there was a beauty to it. You can look at many of these books even today. They're totally uncontaminated by scientific ideology, any kind of ideology. It's almost as if the Soviets felt childhood was not something to be contaminated by ideology. And one respected it. You look at all the books. It's only when you stepped up to the other side and said, Comrade Stalin says so, you knew you had arrived at reality. But look at the ordinary books. Charming. In fact, I wish some regime would now reissue all these children's books. They were so beautiful and they were so scientifically interesting. And in fact, what I loved about it is that Marxism looked like folklore, not ideology, just so stories. And there was something really beautiful about it. In fact, I remember a, friend, a professor of mine telling me, you know, it's Trotsky who should have got the Nobel Prize for Literature, not Churchill. Not a bad statement. Trotsky's history of the Russian Revolution was far more sophisticated than anything Churchill wrote. But that sense of literature, that sense of literariness was, I think, something very important. 
Something we have forgotten today. And I want to begin with this. Because deep down, I feel there was something fascinating by the way ordinary people constructed their Marxism. Not party Marxism, but literary Marxism. I can think of so many of my teachers who talk Marx. I mean, Marx was an aesthetics of justice. In fact, what fascinated me was, to me, Karl Marx was the greatest bookworm. And as a bookworm, he created a theory of politics. And when a bookworm creates a theory of politics, it has to have a celebration of literature. A guy who spends all his time in books and museums can write about the factory, but his unconscious is the book. In fact, Marxism to me is the religion of the book. Sounds heretical, but I think there is something about it where Marxism was a continuous hermeneutic, something to be debated again and again. The Communist Party treated ideology like a textbook, an instruction manual. People who are literary Marxists treated Marxism as a text for constant interpretation. So a text was never closed. A text was perpetually open. A text was subject to perpetual interpretation. And any text which is subject to perpetual storytelling never becomes frozen. Marxism as a text could not be Stalinist. Marxism as a text could, could be. This is in fact some of the insights of the Kunian history of science applied back to Marx. But let me push it further. What fascinated me about Indian Marxism was dissent. In fact, I think Amartya Sen stole the idea of the argumentative Indian from Marxist does. The beauty of Marx was not radicalism. Radicalism was total, holistic. You wanted to destroy a paradigm. But what was beautiful about Marxism in India was dissent, the pluralism of dissent. Every guy had a different opinion. And the pluralism of dissent is something we didn't consider. We used to think it was illiterate. But if anything makes Marxism fascinating, it's in fact it's one of the great dissenting imaginations of the world. Pluralism. And I think the way it haunts Marxism is in a way the source of the death of Stalinism. I want to push this further. A man who is so bookish must have a theory of the book. And that theory of the book must haunt democracy. I think, in fact, I got this idea one day by watching Ashok Bajpayee chair. He has a very easy way of chairing. What I call rules for conviviality. After Illich's tools for conviviality. And then I talked about a lot of other Marxists. And I found that something similar. They loved listening. There are some aesthetics. They give you a theory of democracy, which I think was quite fascinating. And I want to develop this theory. It's not a theory about voting and consumption, which American social science and India bores us with. Voter as citizen. I mean, you get about 20 articles in Hindu and Hindustan Times every day, written by some idiot NRI, talking about the importance of voting or the importance of consumption. Voting and consumption are banal. If voting can create a majoritarian government like the one we have, you've got to rethink it. But Marxism, the sense of gossip it created, the need for conviviality in democracy, I think created a different world. And what I want to do is, these Marxists, without ever mentioning it, brought a different kind of theory. In fact, one of my friends wickedly said, you know what you have to do? Take a bit of Shambhu Mitra, bit of Yuvara Anant Murti, parts of Mukti Bodh, throw in Apurvanand if he's a bit amenable, and put them together in a room, along with a few others. Ask them to generate a theory of democracy. They won't mention citizenship or voting. But they'll talk about conversation. And what's really beautiful about this conversation is its conviviality. But it does three other things which I think is fascinating. The text 
is never arid. In fact, I was thinking of, say, someone like Shambhu Mitra and you are Murti sitting together. And the first thing they'll say is, consumption is boring. What's the use of a revolution that consumes without desire? You know, it's the same critique that Tagore made of Gandhi, that his khadi was not erotic enough. And these literary Marxists would say, democracy was not erotic enough. Because you need the eroticism of the body. You need a sense of desire to sustain democracy. Democracy without desire is boring. As boring as literature without politics without literature. And I think this is one of the first things I would like to emphasize. The fact that the erotic, that sense of fire, that sense of desire has abandoned democracy. Democracy sounds like church going. American social scientists have virtually reduced it to church going. 87% attended church, sorry, politics today. These Marxists are a different sense. A sense of aesthetics, a sense of gossip, a sense of listening, a sense of storytelling, all of which has been abandoned by democracy today. You read an editorial today, it's full of do's and don'ts, prescriptions, it's a catechism. I'm guilty of it too, because that's the only way you get published in journals like Hindu. But that sense, the magic of conversation, is something these Marxists brought back. And they did it by around two characters which they theorized about. I think Shambhu Mitra, Yohan Anand Murthy, as literary people theorized about politics. And their theory of politics was far more fascinating because it centered around the reader and the spectator. Between drama and writing. And what's beautiful is the two greatest parts of the literary imagination were not industrial, but based on craft. So Marxist literary imagination is a craft imagination. It has nothing to do with industry. It has little to do with alienation. In fact, it celebrates participation of the world. A book is a festival. And to me, the sanctity of the book is what makes Marxism more important, spectatorship. Let's take two things. I remember watching Shambhu, reading about Shambhu Mitra. The power of his voice was so memorable. But what he brought back to drama was orality, was memory. That is, to a certain extent, this is a drama which was about type could summon orality. And the power of orality which they returned to drama was fascinating. And if you look at the older generation, the way they recited the slokas, the way they recited drama was a summons to orality. Orality was not supposed to disappear. It was supposed to work itself. And remember Marx writing about Disraeli and Gladstone. Again, it's a summons to orality. The power of orality as the power of memory. Meaning drama as a craft will not let orality become obsolescent. Which type can. That's the power of drama. And two, it's a craft. I remember talking, listening to Adil Hussein recently. He began casually, but he said something interesting and profound. He said, drama is the last craft. It's not like TV. Drama, I only have the body and my voice. And within my body and my voice, I articulate my responsibility as a citizen, as a creative person. In fact, that's why today I would suggest the drama return to every school. Because it's the last great craft. And Marx sensed it. Marxists sensed it. Because I can't think of a group which celebrated theatre more. And reading. Reading was such a brilliant act to them. Because reading demanded that you reread, you reinterpret. That there's no such thing as a one interpretation. For a science which talked about universalism, it actually practiced pluralism. Think of all the dissenting readings on Marx, from Bakunin to Rosa Luxemburg. Every dissent was an act of rereading. That is, what they were saying is, to a certain extent, writing never stops. 
Because when writing stops, reading takes over. And when reading stops, rereading takes over. So the book is never complete. And it also says something interesting. That for a book, there can be no property. You can have authorship. But the very act of rereading makes sure that there's no one owner of the book. Because to own the book, you have to own the interpretation. And the plurality of interpretations make sure the book remains a commons. I think it's a brilliant idea. And I want to push this further by now formulating what I call the six rules of convivial democracy. And this is collected purely from gossip, Marxist gossip. In fact, as one of them put it cynically before, the only time Marxism is boring is when it talks about class. And the only time Marx is classic or has class is when it talks about literature. There's something beautiful of the way Marx talks about democracy and Marxists talk about democracy. So here are the seven rules. I'm going to call them the rights of democracy after Nimichandra Jain. And look at the way they talked about it because I think in a way it led you to a certain different understanding of democracy around language. It's not economics, it's not political economy that becomes the center of the imagination, it's language. We have a linguistic model of democracy. So you begin with, in fact I realized it first with PPH. The first right is the right to a book. The second right is the right to a book in several languages. The third right is the right to translation. And the man we are honoring today was a man who was fascinated by translation. Who felt Hindi had to be there because it gave you access not only to language, it was a theory of justice. And that's the first law. The right to translation as a right to justice. In fact, I was wondering why Rahul Sankrita and Jain all were speaking about the right to Hindi. It was not just the right to Hindi, it was the right of access to different languages. And access needed translation. Translation, in fact, anchored the theory of democracy and language. Let me push it further. The right to translation demanded a right to hermeneutics. That is, every time you wrote a book, someone had to misread it or read it in a different way. Democracy needed literary criticism. And literary criticism was a model of democracy, not the American idea of participation. Literary criticism presupposed knowledge, it presupposed citizenship, it presupposed involvement, it presupposed an engagement with the other. That's more than democracy ever demanded of the vote. Thirdly, it was dialogic. The Adda was the center of democracy. I can't think of Indian democracy without the Adda, without gossip. In fact, Indira Gandhi during the emergency was right. First thing she did was, she said, break all the centers for Adda. Break the coffee house. Because to me, the coffee house was the center of Marxism. Forget revolution. The best gossip came in the coffee houses. And that was the beauty and celebration of it. The celebration of language. It's a celebration of the possibilities of translation. It's a celebration of disagreement. You might like the coffee, but you had to debate about everything else. There's a beauty to it. The third thing is the right to irony and parody. Because a democracy without humor will not work. It needed a sense of laughter. And language provided opportunities for laughter by the very nature of language. The beauty of reading was it was always incomplete. Because the minute you finished an interpretation, someone else would reinterpret it. Reading was incomplete, so was democracy. And the incompleteness of reading and democracy sustained the continuous creativity. And a last thing. When you look at or hear Shambhu Mitra, you hear all these people, you hear the power of orality. So democracy becomes the social contract between three mediums, the oral, the textual, and the digital. 
memory is sustained, not abandoned. Interpretation is encouraged. So what we have is a new kind of social contract where democracy recreates the debate between the oral, the textual, and the digital. It's a new theory of culture. But I think eventually what Marxism was preoccupied with was the creativity of culture. Yes, it did discuss economics in some pages. But I think even that economics came out to a different kind of consideration. You know, I was just thinking of the various Marxists I met and spent time with. Mashweta Devi, sitting with Ganesh Devi. And here was a woman who understood what orality meant. I remember a story, the pterodactyl, about a tribal who finds that an old bird, over 25 million old years old, has come to Purnia. It is sitting in the cave waiting to die. A journalist hears this and goes to write the story when he finds the tribal sitting next to the pterodactyl. In complete affinity. Tribal and pterodactyl, he suddenly realized, had a collectivity, an affinity, a kinship, which no modern journalist could have. Mashweta, a Marxist, understood this. And she went on to theorize about it because she showed that bonded labor was the price orality paid to the text. A tribal gives his word as a bond. He signs a little chit which commits him to five generations of bondage. Mashweta showed that orality becomes captive to textuality in this world of industrialism. I thought that was brilliant. Then I remember Samik Mandapadya sitting at Higudu. And some people had warned him, don't go near him, he's CPM type. I said, no, let me risk it, I want to talk to him. There were these guys sitting and talking at Higudu, one of the greatest places. But I remember, it started by KV Subanna. And Subanna used to tell me, I, want, I can't go to the world. I'm too old and tired. I want the world's theater to come to me. And Higudu, Nanasam Theater, was the place where all the world's theater came. Fascinating. And Subana used to proudly say, he'd always first have a bit of an areca nut. And while it weakened, he'd say, Do you know Bertolt Brecht's Crime of Galileo has been performed more times in Malayalam than in German. Munches areca nut a bit more and say, Truth to be true had to be true in two languages. Brecht sounds more convincing in Malayala. There's a beauty to it, there's a charm. And I remember there was Savik Mandapai sitting and saying, we have to bring, and he had a very didactic way of speaking, especially when he thought people were slightly dull like me, we have to bring Athens to Hegudu. But there was a dream. There was a sense that civilization could enter any place, any village, and Shomikta loved it. Every year, regardless of what happened, he would leave Calcutta, come to Hegudu, and act as the commentator for this entire thing. He and Yura Anand Murti. Ten days of stunning theatre, done in every language in the world and translated, hosted by a community which cooked tremendous food. In fact, it's that time they realized economists don't understand rights. They talk about the right to food. And there was Shamita explaining, a right to food without the right to cooking is incomplete. Because the right to food is only an entitlement. A right to cooking gives you the plurality of worlds a right entitles you. Mere food is physiological. But cooking gives you a diversity of imaginations, of storytelling, any right needs. Otherwise it's banal. At the most, you can push it up to Amartya Sen. But not further. The sense of the commons, that sense of language is missing. And I think it's in this context that I want to look at the way they looked at language. I remember Yuval Anathmuthi talking to me about UNESCO. He said the American idea of UNESCO is such a bad idea. There you translate books from the vernacular to English. But never from the vernacular to the vernacular. The conversation is incomplete because it's perpetually aborted. 
English is the closure of the conversation of the vernacular. And he said, I dream a new vernacular. I dream a new UNESCO. Where? From Tamil to Spanish. We don't need the brokerage of English. There's a playful suggestion, but I think it was a fascinating one. UNESCO would have been different. English sahibs wouldn't have controlled the canonical texts. And there was a beauty to that imagination. And now I want to push it a bit further. You know, when you look at these Marxists, they quoted Marx, they quoted Simone Weil, they quoted Eliot, they quoted Shakespeare. In fact, sometimes you wonder whether Karl Marx was a professor of literature when you read his works. In fact, for a long time, I thought Das Kapital was a kind of play written in a new language called social science. It had an epic quality to it. And Marx was a master of epics, though he would have preferred Heinrich Heine to Shakespeare, or maybe Goethe. But still, he had that sense of epic drama. It had a sense of plurality which I found fascinating. Yes, let me give you two examples. You see it actually not just in language but in science. I remember in my times, one of my great heroes used to be Joseph Needham. Secularists hated him because they hit the fact that actually Needham delivered Sunday school sermons at Cambridge University every week. Gregory Blue testifies to it. And what he said was something fascinating. He said, Marxism in German isn't Marxism. It has to be translated to Welsh. Translation gives you that creativity. And that same thing happened when John Haldane came to India. Tired Marxist, hard-headed, sort of beaming dialectics. Roams around Orissa and he beams dialects. He goes to the Central Rice Research Institute, suddenly sees a few hundred thousand varieties of rice and says, it's the most spectacular thing I've seen. And he becomes an advocate of mixed cropping. Diversity, Marxist celebrated diversity, not equality. Equality in itself was dull. And I want to end this with two stories of two kinds of Marxism we don't talk about, which are absolutely fascinating. One was occult Marxism. It was called Theosophy. No, 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 no. It's, every one of you thinks it's a cranky thing. I spent 10 years in the Theosophist archives. Let me begin with a quotation from William Morris's diary. The most brilliant Marxist in England today is a woman called Annie Besant. It's there in the Marxist. Occult, who were the other great Marxists? The first great advocate of the Indian uh, independence, Alfred Wallace, socialist, working class scientist, who actually wrote a book on the need for diversity in science. What did they say? That when a working class emerges, it'll be tired and without ideas. You need to add the imagination of gender to it. Equality by itself is uniformity. You need equality which gives you the availability of alternative ideas. I remember Patrick Geddes who taught Annie Besant as a tutor saying, to ask a woman to do a man's job is like asking Beethoven to drive a truck. Mere equality doesn't guarantee you anything. And one had that same current because the theosophists were actually masters of the sensorium. Kandinsky on color was fantastic. They dreamt childhood, and the notions of childhood they had were spectacular. In fact, the Boy Scout was invented in India. The original Boy Scout was a Boer racist. Annie Besant converted him to an animal-loving child. Opposite of the Boy Scout, the Wolf Boy. And out of it comes the great theories of Maria Montessori, who spent years in India as an intern an Italian in turn. These people, the theosophists were brilliant. I remember the other day someone said, Salim Ali is the father of Indian ornithology. Such illiteracy. It was Alan Hook, David Hume who started Stray Feathers. Salim Ali just picked it up and followed it. Hume was actually wanting to be a theosophist. Helena Blavatsky finessed him. 
Theosophy in that sense was a dream of childhood, a dream of color. What's the use of equality when you don't have new imaginations? And I think that was the beauty of Theosophy. And one sees that same passion when you come to something new today. The fishing struggle, which to me was the last great Marxist struggle of our time. Inspired by Christian theology, a conversation between Christians and Marxists. I can't think of anything more Marxist or anything more Christian. Because both the party and the church were challenged simultaneously. And it was an attempt to understand economics in a new way. Because the primacy was not the job but livelihood. In India you don't need to protect jobs, you need to protect livelihoods. That is, the job and the ecology must be sustained. The catamaran can only fight with the trawler when you rethink a new science, when you rethink a new theology. My old teacher, C.V. Shashadri, in fact, fought the catamaran, fought the trawlers by building fish aggregation devices which were three stories high. So the 25 species of fish could travel inward to confound the trawlers. He dreamt of a different kind of science. And Jesuits, like Father Ryan, Tom Kochery, if you can call him one, dreamt of a different kind of Christianity. I can't think of a greater kind of Marxist imagination today than the fishing struggle in Kerala. I want to do all these three things, I want to emphasize one thing. Marxism, rather than being universalist, outside the party was one of the great plural forces. It understood memory. It understood interpretation. It understood storytelling. And it also understood that Stalinism was the end of storytelling. I think we need something like that today. Because the Prime Minister is like a Stalinist. Remove the turban, add a soup strainer, moustache, he's not very different. Sorry, I'm stealing your lines. but I think what one has to understand here is we need a different kind of culture. We need a plural theory of culture, a culture located in the everydayness of life which can challenge what is happening today. The Marxist imagination outside the party provided it. It dreamt a new culture. It dreamt everything from a new language to new music to a new idea of color. It created what I call an aesthetics of justice. Justice need not be boring, banal, bare. You need a different aesthetics of justice to sustain culture. And Marxism did that. You know when the RSS today alters the cosmos, the syllabus, the constitution and the commons, I wish the Addas would revolt. Because the kind of perspectives they had provide a perfect antidote to the absence of culture today. I want to salute all those anonymous Marxists who taught me that democracy can be good, true and beautiful. And I think it's time we acknowledge them. There are no books about them. Small tributes. But I think the time has come when we expand the story into a collective story. I think we get an epic which provides one of the creation myths that can challenge the ruling regime today. Might might be a bookworm's dream, but I've always been told bookworms are dangerous. I'll stop there. Thank you. some questions. So ask sharp, brief, witty questions. Yes. In that order? Uh, oh, well, <laughs> sure. I was we we'll bring the my fascinating <laughs> lecture. But I'm astounded by one statement of yours, which is that the Soviets kept childhood and science out of ideological contamination. PPH. How, much, how do you explain Lysenko then? Oh I think you should read the new work of Lysenko. It's very different. Lysenko was completely ideological. His work was empirical. But the kind of work he did on the extension of seeds was purely empirical. 
had nothing to say with it. Then the, the contrast you have to make is between Lysenko and Vygotsky and Luria. Vygotsky and Luria had fascinating theories of childhood. I don't think Lysenko had a childhood. Sorry, I've been reading a lot on Lysenko and teaching it. I, I, I think the two doesn't, don't come into picture together. In fact, if you look at Lorraine Graham's last interviews on Lysenko, I think the man was hatched a Stalinist. I, I, I don't think he had any other notion of socialization theory. He was not a Marxist in that sense. He had a theory of reflexive behavior. And he extended that to seeds. And he felt some of the things were empirical, but was overgeneralized into an ideology. Lysenko had no notion of childhood. I've read it clearly. Vygotsky had. History would have been different if Vygotsky rather than Lysenko came into being. He was the greatest of Soviet psychologists. Just a minute. Wait. So I didn't say great Marxists don't join politics. Yeah, Some Marxists do join politics. But I think a lot of them are political without joining the party. It's they who I find fascinating. A lot of them, you know, if you look at the sheer conversations we had, Marxism was fascinating as gossip, as a way of looking at things, as a way of analyzing things. There was politics enough in it. I won't insist on the party as the end of any Marxist. And anyway, the Communist Party of India was so Stalinist, it was dull. I can't think of a more boring party in the 50s. Sorry. And I think the different kinds of politics. I think many of these were autobiographically political. They fought the patriarchy of the family through the Marxism. They talked about justice in language as a way of making sure the education system was wider. So it was a kind of series of overlapping micropolitics. But they had a tremendous sense of justice. And I found that fascinating. And a similar sense of empathy that went with justice. So justice was never abstract. It was a lived justice. And I think to me that's very necessary today. No one gives you abstract lectures on poverty development, except certain economists I know and World Bank. But a literature of suffering is a different kind of narrative. It empathizes. It captures the colors of suffering. There's a part to it, a phenomenology to it, which mere structure cannot understand. Yes. It's love your views on Namdev uh, Dasan, Gopi Nair, the Dalit Panthers. How do you read that? I don't. Because let me say that a lot of my understanding, apart from, say, people like Yuan Anand Murthy, and a few others, is secondary. But I have picked up from commentaries. I mean, I think someone like Apurvanand could hold forth for three hours. So I won't allow him to do that. But I'm saying, what they had was a theory of writing and literature. I think it added tremendously to the imagination. When, when Rahul Sankratayan says, I want to translate, and he can think in so many languages, I think he's saying the same thing you are Anandaputi put in a different way. He said an illiterate in India can think in seven languages. A convent school girl writes in only one. And I think the tragedy of our democracy is we only think in one language. That power of translation of plurality, if it comes back, I think we have a different way of representing our world. Yeah. When he visited the Rice Institute, uh, the 
very fascinating but it's versatile. Uh, you paint the picture of many of these boxes as if they're, you know, uh, they have a bit of a contradiction in the sense that uh, uh, how do you reconcile modern uh, uh, you know, appreciation of diversity and his advocacy of eugenics. Many of the Marxists of the time were advocating eugenics. Many of the Marxists were fascinated by eugenics. I, I think there's a brilliant study we should read by a former friend of mine, friend of mine, Francis Zimmerman, Why Haldane Came to India. It's in a book, Dominating Knowledge, edited by the Marglins. I think it shows how this guy, who's secretly an English Brahmin, fascinated by caste, starts unraveling this whole process. So instead of the standard dialectics, He's fascinated and within the language of his own hybridity, mixtures, mixed cropping. And he's wondering whether mixed cropping can be the solution for the agricultural revolution in India. So a lot of his work and Dronam Raju's, in fact the whole Orissa center went into capturing this mixed imagination. You know whether you read Haldane's at a book on peacock's tails, originally you felt there had to be a reason for a peacock's tail. There's none. Nature sometimes is beautiful out of a perverse need to be beautiful. I think that was brilliant. And I think Holden captured that. You know, I was just recently reading some of his lectures. I think what stunned him was India had a kind of diversity they hadn't thought about. Whether it was looking at just silks, which his wife was interested in. But you know, a society which has the estimates vary, I'll give you the lowest order. 125,000 varieties of rice has 120,000 varieties of myth and dreaming. Eugenics would be a very boring science when you have the availability of so many alternatives. True, I think to a certain extent he was sensing the racial possibilities of eugenics. In a way he would have been the most cautious about these things. And I think it's a tremendous sense of Indian society. I think that's what made Holden so fascinated about diversity. I wish the Indian Statistical Institute, instead of hiring all those Russian economists, had listened to Holden on diversity. As I uh, understood uh, some of uh, the uh, ideas you presented today, uh, you know, sort of, if I had a direct contrasting kind of aesthetic Marxism with a more deterministic, reductionist uh, version of Marxism, mm. the scientized, uh, ideologically oriented version of Marxism. And what is so refreshing also, I think, is that your lecture was marked by a kind of dialectical wit, which sometimes perhaps goes missing in uh, the secondary version which you've been critiquing. Uh, and yet, the irony is that in our own context, the progressive writers do somehow uh, bought too much into that developmentalist, ideological version of Marxism. And somehow, that is why they became puritanically oriented. Uh, they could not stand Manto, for example. Hmm. So how does one explain that, that this more invigorated version of Marxism, the Adda style Marxism... I'm glad you raised Manto. <laughs> because apart from being the historian of partition, he was actually the greatest film correspondent we had. Bom Manto on Bombay Talkies is brilliant. And there's a statement he makes there which he says, Bombay Talkies is only possible. It's the only answer to partition. Because it's the only place where Hindu and Muslim can combine to be creative. Manto died missing Bombay Talkies. If they're progressives like Manto, I have no problem. But actually, progressive over the time as it becomes ideological, sometimes loses its creative power. One has to accept that. Ipta today is not as interesting as the Ipta of yesterday. It sounds like one, something written by a textbook maniac. S is for solidarity. P is for progress kind of thing. And give it a break. <laughs> but the original idea was stunning. And I think it's time we look. Ipta could not only be a counter to the CPM of Prakash Karat, it could be a counter to the RSS today. As a theory of culture, the theory of creativity. Yeah? It would even improve the quality of the street plays they do recently. Why <laughs> 
Oh, I think Marxism was quite cosmopolitan. One. Two, I think we understood that. Three, I think in a deep and fundamental way, I think a lot of European Marxism was very creative. You didn't translate it. Two, I think European Marxism had to meet Stalinism in a way we didn't have to confront. Stalinism sort of dried up possibilities. But India under Nehru, you could multiply possibilities with fascinating insight. You know, we could dream. I remember Hussein Zahir telling Indira Gandhi, as Nixon was attacking, you need to remove from the petroleum base of civilization. I can't think of a European Marxist saying that. I think while the European Marxists had fantastic ideas, many of them have gone underground. But if you were to go back and look at the Samistat registers, I think you see a very powerful European imagination on everything from jazz to science. I think we have to recover that. You know, publishing company like Siegel recovered Eisenstein. I'd go on and re recover all the dissenting Marxisms. Maybe that's the task of India. A recovery of the dissenting Marxisms, a hermeneutics of it, and an act of translation. I think it would be fascinating. And that includes socialism. I think between so Indian Marxism and socialism and European Marxism, you can start a new dialogue, which would be fascinating. I think it's a good idea. Maybe we should recover PPH to begin this. of citizenship. When identity is confused with identification, you have one kind of problem. Yeah. Two, you begin with the whole idea is why should citizenship be defined by the state? You could have a whole series of civil society definitions of it. Three, the very fact that you have linguistic plurality means you have plural definitions of citizenship. I don't need the RSS to define my citizenship. In fact, I'm surprised that a party which had almost no understanding of nationalist history should define my sense of nationalism and patriotism. I'm not ready to accept it. If that's anti-national, I think it's a good way of defining an Indian today. Anybody else? Last question. What? Yours. <laughs> so thank you very much. <coughs> you should not. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming in such large number to listen to a very provocative uh, lecture. This is perhaps the most provocative lecture we ever had in this series. <laughs> and uh, so much the better because Nemiji would have dearly liked it. Uh, he, he was a man who used to like this battle of ideas and things of that kind. So oh, oh, it was very interesting. There are several questions which arise which may, uh, may be dealt with in reflection in some degree of interrogation data. Thank you very much. Uh, we are very grateful on behalf of Nimi Nidhi and Natrang Pratishthan that all of you came here. And of course, thank you very much, Sri Vishwanathan. You brought the lecture to a provocative level which will be fine perhaps difficult to maintain later. Thank you very much.